so first of all we are having uh, in this session to that is we are covering in this session will be like a uh, threshold and filter uh, so before going into this depth i will just first uh, show the application hold on a second okay i just go and show you an example about where we are using this thing so uh, in deep learning suppose uh, imagine and uh, now imagine uh, suppose we are making a uh, surveillance camera or whatever it is cctv there and you want to detect uh, you know humans so basically how any one i deploy a deep learning model for that and uh, for to train that model you need certain amount of data with that you need a lot of data uh, and uh, this is a quite common topic so you, you may get the data but uh, there are certain applications uh, applications there are still there where you won't find that data that is a label data And in deep learning segmentation specifically, uh, we don't label the things like you know we, this is not a classification, right? So basically, we don't label uh, label each image into a single label. We just uh, we basically put a label to every pixel of a single image and every image of we are we are having. So uh, to do that, what we do, we basically create a ground truth that is called the label is in terms of this. This is called ground truth. So basically, we create a, a ground truth mask that is uh, basically hold on a second. This one, this image appears. So, basically, corresponding to uh, corresponding to the image which we had earlier, this image we will have a ground truth image that is this one. Uh, in order to create that, uh, we need to manually segment these images using certain uh, techniques. So, obviously, you won't be going into MS Paint and uh, you know manually coloring all these portions, but uh, there are certain simple ways to do that. And that is where thresholding and probably filters also come. And filters uh, filters are specifically for machine learning applications because In machine learning, you won't uh, actually when we use machine learning because if we have a lot of data, we will directly moving on to deep learning. But in machine learning, we don't have that much of that data, right? So we apply filters, and there is a very important step that is involved in machine learning that is called feature engineering. Basically, you manually extract all the features from an image data that we already have, uh, and then we feed those data to the train uh, to train the model. So basically, uh, uh, to in those steps, we use filters. So basically, that is why I am going to uh, explain the filter part as well. So, uh, so what we do is, so I'll just go to the slides and explain the various thresholds that we are going to use. So, uh, we have various thresholds that is offered by OpenCV, that is uh, which uh -huh. the library that we are using here. Uh, so, what happens? The first library that is we are going to use is basically the first uh, function that is basically binary threshold. Because there is one kind of thresholding that we use, uh, it is binary thresholding. So, uh, this is pretty simple. It is as it is uh, because basically we just take a threshold value. That is basically this is a pixel value, and this is uh, here we have chosen 127 because you know it, this uh, forms the it is basically midway between the zero and 255 mark. So basically we just uh, keep the threshold to be 127, and we apply the binary threshold to the input image. Uh, for this image, we have just taken a gradient image. This is called the gradient image. So you just find in in uh, uh, I have just downloaded it from Google, and, uh, Google, so you can do the do the same. What we do is uh, we apply this binary thresholding technique onto this input image that we are having here. So what it does, uh, suppose a pixel value we have there is a pixel, pixel value of a number like of a pixel. The pixel value is less than the threshold, then it is set to the zero or it is a black color. And suppose the pixel value is greater than the threshold, then it is set to a black or a blue or white color. That is what we are having here. So basically, the uh, threshold 127 is basically this value that I am covering over my cursor right now. Uh, so any value that is less than this particular threshold value of the pixel will be basically turned to black, as you can see right here. And anything that is equivalent to or is greater than the threshold, it will be turned to basically white, as you can see right here. One other is basically binary inverse, that is basically this one. This is this is just the opposite of the binary uh, threshold. Let's hold on a second. Okay. Uh, this is the opposite of uh, what we have here. Uh, so basically, it just turns the it does the opposite thing. That is, a pixel if the value is basically less than one uh, threshold, then it will be turned to white. And if it is more than the threshold value, that is one twenty seven in this case, it will turn it to uh, black. So this is a uh, binary uh, inverse thresholding. Now moving on, we have two zero thresholding. Uh, this is a bit interesting. That is, if the pixel value is less than the threshold, then it is turned to black. That is, pixel value is replaced by a zero. And if it is Greater than threshold, or it is equal to threshold, then it is basically replaced by the by the value itself that it is, it is having from the input. That is why you see uh, this portion up to the threshold. That is, this is the portion. You the below values are basically turned to black, as you can see here, and the uh, uh, the values which are having a uh, you know the number greater than the threshold are turned uh, basically that remains the same. 
this is what you do in through your threshold link uh, and uh, for the and there's one more that is called truncated threshold link and this this is just a bit different than that what happens is uh, whenever the pixel value is less than uh, 127 that is the threshold you are giving and this uh, threshold value you can manually set that in the program for sure uh, so that depends upon your application in which you are applying uh, one thing to mind here is that uh, the images that you're using that are all actually grayscale images so this is one thing to note while doing threshold link you can also do it in uh, RGB, but process just changes a bit. And obviously, you can apply those, but you need to have this particular thing. I think it, is, it should be a great image. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, as much as I did the research, uh, it is what it is. Uh, so, uh, in a truncated testing, what we do is basically uh, if you have a threshold value and if the pixel value is less than threshold, then it remains the same as you can see right here. But if it is equal to the threshold, or it is greater than a threshold value, that is the pixel value, it will be replaced by the threshold value. As you can see here, the threshold value is 127, this will be represented by this particular portion. So every value that is greater than that are replaced by that threshold value, as you can see here. So I think up to here, I think all are pretty much clear about it. If anyone has any doubts or concerns, you can just, uh, you know, write in the, write it in the chat box right here. Uh, do you have anyone, anyone, if anyone has doubts? Or is it clear or should I go it again? Can I reply on the chat box? Is everything clear up to this point? This reply on the chat box. So that I can move Okay. Okay, I'm getting on this one. Okay, great. Okay, moving on. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so, We'll just do the coding part of this particular threshold link because uh, next is the output that is a bit different than this. So, so I'll just go ahead and do the coding part of this just to keep the things in line. Uh, so what we have here is the threshold link. Uh, so initially, obviously, we'll just go ahead and just at the kernel. Okay. So for this, first of all, uh, we just grab this libraries and we just import those libraries that is we are importing CV2, NumPy, because if you want to do some, and obviously the image is basically a NumPy array of numbers, of pixels basically. Uh, import NumPy to AT1 to any manipulations for the code, but maybe it's not, but if it is. But we have just imported those, and Matplotlib is always uh, good to, you know, if someone, if, if at, at some point we can just uh, do some uh, graphical stuff. So obviously we just uh, import this three libraries. And these are probably uh, the most important libraries, uh, one of the most important uh, libraries, one of the most important libraries in Python that they offer. So first of all, we're going to read this image that is the uh, data.tif, that is basically the same image that you are seeing right here. This is the input image that we are using in this code uh, for this demonstration purpose. Uh, and then we just, we just go ahead and run this so that this will reach the image into the into a variable called img. And uh, for those who don't know what this IM read is, basically just read the images from the document, the folder directory that you have. And this, uh, you know, this, this is this is basically a, a, a uh, this is basically a function provided by CV2 library. And uh, one thing more, actually, there is one more argument that you can give here. It is one zero or one. Probably, I think more than that. This basically changes the color space you are working in. Suppose if I give it as a zero, then this a uh, particular function will read the image as a grayscale image, but we are not going to do it here for certain reasons. Uh, but yeah, we can do. We can go ahead and do that as well because we are all finally working on uh, grayscale image. So uh, after reading this image, we can see the shape of this image. So if you do img dot shape, being a numpy, it just pops out this shape of this uh, image. So you can clearly see here it has a five one two and five one two and three. This for the first two values basically represents the height and the length, uh, height and the width of the image, and this three basically represents the how many channels are there. And in uh, TV2, if you just uh, read it as it is, by default it reads any image as a three uh, channel image. Basically, it basically reads as that as a as a uh, RGB image. So uh, for our application, we are going to convert this RGB image into a grayscale image. That is why it is we are having this particular function right here. It is CV2, uh, uh, CV2 dot CVT color, that is basically color convert, convert color, CVT color, and we take in the image that we want to change the color space of, and then we just do CV2 color BGR to gray. Now, one thing that is interesting, we are talking about RGB, but here we have BGR. So, uh, anyone who is working with uh, OpenCV for me at time, for like, you know, for six months or so, or even for like two, three months will know that the color convention for OpenCV is not RGB, but it is a BGR. 
So it can be a bit uh, like you know weird for some people, but yeah, it is what it is. And actually, you can change this uh, RGB like even in the same this particular function, you can just uh, change this gray to actually RGB. That is color BGR to RGB. It just changes to RGB convention. And but but over time, just get acquainted with this that and just easy. So uh, once uh, we read this, I'm just gonna run that and we just get this. So this is the like grayscale image, and I'm gonna show you this shape. Now this is where let me. Yeah, so you can see here, since it's a single channel image, we have, uh, is this screen visible? I think so. Okay, so uh, since uh, we are having only you know, the one channel, so basically it is only having the high channel width and not the three channels that I have shown earlier. Okay, so, so just now, okay, so first of all, I'm gonna obviously just show the, uh, the images that we are having right now. Uh, so as you can see here, this is the original image that we are having, and since it is a grayscale image, as uh, like you know, as from as we have downloaded it, so uh, after even converting it to a uh, uh, like you know, to a grayscale image, it will just look the same, obviously. Uh, so this is the, uh, the the grayscale image that we ultimately formed. But the thing that difference in these two images is that this is a three-channel image, and this is a one-channel image. As you can see, I have just shown the shape of this image. We just uh, tap Q on there and you can just see that. Now, uh, for the thresholding, we have actually used this threshold that is, uh, we have put this as 127 as of now. And now, this is the function that CV2 provides, which basically does the thresholding for us. We just, we just need to give some parameters here and there and just we get the thing. Uh, so, what do you do? Uh, so, uh, this, uh, as, as far as the uh, like, uh, Python conventions are concerned, so basically, this, basically, this uh, function gives us two return values, but the first value is there, basically it just says key whether the thing, uh, like the operation is done successfully or not. This is basically it's a binary value, it's a zero or one, or basically boolean value, you can see. Uh, so we don't need that part. So basically we want just, we just want the uh, final image that is prepared by the particular function. So basically we just give an underscore there, and that is a Python way of saying key, I don't want this particular parameter, I don't, I'm not concerned about this, but I just want to ignore that thing. So just, you just put an underscore there, and just, uh, since there is a two value that we're returning, the second value is the image that is the uh, that is basically the threshold that image that you are getting. So uh, CV2 the threshold is a function that we are having. So it takes certain parameters. First is the image on which you are basically applying the uh, threshold, and next is this is the threshold parameter that is this value you are talking about. Like, uh, like what is the threshold you want to put it in manually? So this is uh, what it is, and then you have this is the 255. This is just a maximum value of a pixel that it can have. And since we are going for the 8 bit convention, so let's say we have a uh, pixel like pixel value from 0 to 255, that is 2 to the power 8. So this is 256. And starting from 0, we have up to 255. Just hold on a second. Okay. Great. Guys, actually, uh, I'll just tell you this because, you know, uh, just uh, we actually start our, uh, like, we try to start our sessions just after five minutes or so that I can actually help you. So, uh, like, it will be better if you can join a bit early. Uh, but it is, this is just this is because you can get the entire thing. So, it is no problem, obviously, for sure. Okay, moving on. Uh, so, what you do is, uh, so, this is the, basically the uh, the function that we are using here. And this CG2 trash binary. So, this way, JR defined a binary, or I like guess, threshold operation that you can do, as I have already mentioned. So, uh, this particular thing, the CV2 trash binary basically tells this function what type of thresholding that is to be done on that particular input image. I hope I'm clear about that. So, basically, we have a uh, threshold binary, then the uh, binary inverse threshold, then choose your threshold, and then we have trunk, which is trash trunk, which is just the same. Okay. Okay. Then, uh, just you can run this thing so that we can get the particular images and Okay, yeah, and behind this, now we're gonna run this thing. Yeah, this four values, are, uh, no, this is this potential run. Now we have our images, that is our uh, threshold that images from in figure one and this, this particular variable. So we, we're gonna just run this thing and you're gonna just, uh, you know, that you can just see the result uh, for sure. Now this is the first binary image that we're gonna see right here. And this, this is the binary image. So we had our input image as this one, and when we did binary thresholding based upon the threshold value of 127, it it just give us gave us this one. That is, any value less than 127 will be black, and any value which is basically greater than 127 will be basically white. 
So just gonna give Q and just end this. Then we're gonna do the inverse one, and it is the image, this one right here. And this is what this is the opposite of that we had earlier, right? This is, the, this is exactly the opposite. That is the threshold value if it is uh, greater than uh, the threshold value. That the threshold value is greater than the threshold value, it will be turning it to black, and otherwise it will be turning it to white. So this is the filling in. Uh, so this is the binary inverse one, and then we have our I think two zero threshold thing. So yeah, that is it. Basically, if the threshold value is uh, if the pixel value is less than the threshold value, it will turn it to a black pixel. Otherwise, it will just keep the input image the same, which is keeping. So this is one. And the last one we are going to do is the truncated one. So you can see right here, this is a truncated one. Because every uh, like pixel value, if it is uh, less than the threshold, then it will be keeping it as it is. And if it is more than that, the pixel value will be replaced by the threshold value that we are putting. In this case, 127. So this is what uh, threshold thing, that the normal threshold thing that we, we are using does. Now, uh, I think up to here, if anyone have any doubt, then I can clear this out. So anyone have doubt this? Okay. Okay, this is just an extension. Uh, cool, and just, uh, just EIFF yeah, is just an extension. This is the field that's the uh, NJP, just similar to that. Okay. Any other questions that you have or anyone have can just write it in the chat box. Or is it clear to this point? Then you can just, uh, yeah, you can just text it in the chat box. Is it clear to this point? Okay, great. Any other responses? Okay, great. Okay, great. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so what we have is O2 threshold. Now this is a bit tricky. Now up to this point, we have been manually basically giving the threshold value that is 127, right? Now that is actually not uh, practical at certain levels because you obviously don't know what that threshold value would be or actually you can know that but you need to do certain statistical measure of the particular image that you are going uh, you are you are working on to get the particular value so uh, what you can do is you can use osu's thresholding basically it finds the thresholding like you know it just finds the threshold automatically now there is one thing called bimodal images now i think most of you have actually seen uh, like uh, you know night vision images right I'm just going to show you right here. Um, in this image you're having here, you can clearly see there are basically two groups of pixel values, right? One is basically uh, that is of light, the light green, or there is more brightness in this particular type of green, and there is a one is a background that is it is having more darkish kind of shade. Basically, any image which have basically these two groups that is uh, quite visible, and by groups I mean this is basically a group of pixel values and not uh, one single uh, pixel value, obviously. Uh, uh, like so, we are having these two groups of uh, pixels, and we are using those pixels to uh, those pixels. This is basically called binomy by bi bimodal images. Basically, basically it has two uh, group of pixels. Now, that is uh, from an intuition point of view. Now, if you are going mathematically into it, now you need to know this that the if you are going statistically, that this is the type of if you do if you do basically if you find a histogram for this particular image and the frequency distribution. It gives us two peaks. This two peaks are the main criteria of, of an image to be said as a bimodal image. So basically, this peak obviously this is the ideal case where we have the two peaks which are of same height, but you can obviously have different peaks as well. So basically, it is also said as uh, you know bimodal. So this is one thing. Uh, so basically, it has as you can see here. Uh, so I'll just attach a like you know for the for the next post from our handles. There will be a, like there will be a drive link where we will be putting all the research papers and everything that we have used for this. And there is one beautiful paper right here. I'll just show this where actually it is defined. Uh, you can see right here in this paper actually they have actually gone show this algorithm that they also actually use. So this is all the basically it just finds the threshold value, the desired threshold that it is finding right here. I'm not going into depth because it is entirely mathematics and those parts. I'm not going to that, but I will obviously suggest you to do that. And also, it has all the other functions that we have mentioned so far. Like we have the truncated and everything, threshold to zero and whatever it is. But if I mean, it is there. So, uh, moving on. Uh, so, we can actually, uh, uh, hold on. Yeah. So, uh, we can do OSU threshold link. Now, OSU threshold link technique basically, as I have already mentioned, automatically determines the threshold value. But this can be applied to every threshold link value there, there it is out there. And it can use it in binary threshold link, binary inverse, to look at anyone, anywhere. So these are some of the outputs that we have done 
like I have already done this. Uh, so I did hear from the outputs that we have done on this particular biomodal image. And uh, for the for the sake of the example, I'll just hold on a second. This one, and you can. Yeah, this biomodal image. You can clearly see here that this surrounding surrounding from this particular tank has a lighter shade of gray and hence can be grouped together into a single group. And this particular okay, this particular tank has a like you know more darker side of the uh, gray color or the say towards it is more towards the uh, you know towards the zero end. So basically, uh, this is a clearly a grouping out there. So basically, you can this is a biomodal. If you do the histogram of this, you will obviously see a peak there. Uh, and obviously not that much, but yeah, you will see that. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and do the uh, you know the coding portion of this. And for this, uh, we are this image post to the PIFF, and again this is the extension. And this time I'm reading it as a grayscale image, so this is why there is a zero in this particular IM read function. So I'm gonna go ahead and just run this. It is red, and yeah, you can actually you can uh, instead of doing IM, you can also do PLD dot IM, so that I can show you in this particular console out here, as you can see right here. Now we are going to apply this binary threshold. Now uh, this is the function that we apply for this particular thresholding, that is threshold. Obviously, this is the threshold is the, uh, the, the, the like the function we are going to use. And then that this is the image that we have taken. And instead of threshold, that is 127 that we have used earlier. In this case, we will use a zero. And the maximum value will be obviously was 55. And then in this case, to save the program that it is basically an old suit uh, thresholding and not a normal thresholding, what we do is in, with with Along with passing this particular value that is cg to the test binary, which tells the program that it is a binary threshold, we also pass the value. This we give a plus sign and we just do this particular argument. We just pass it on and cg to the test O2. This basically tells the program that this is a basically O2 thresholding. Basically, you need to find the thresholding on your own and then do the binary thresholding. And this is how it does. So see, I'm going to run this uh, four things together, and this gives the basically it just stores the value in this particular variable. And now we're going to see this all the, together. Just show this together. And just explain. Yeah. As you can see here, this is the binary image that we are having, binary thresholding. And this time that the threshold has been find, found automatically by the, uh, by the O2 algorithm. And next we have, this is the binary inverse. As you can see here, this image is exactly the you know, like negation of this. It's the exact opposite of this. So these are the two binary and uh, binary inverse. And then we have two zero. As you can see here, this particular tank that we had had a value that will be obviously less, since it was more towards the darker side, it will be obviously less than the threshold, as you already mentioned. So this will be going directly to the, this, 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 this original, the original image, the pixel value in the tank will be obviously less than the particular threshold. So basically it is turned to black, and the remaining portion remains as it was. Right. This is the 20 threshold, and then we have the last one, that is the truncated one. What it did was uh, every pixel value that had a value less than the threshold will be kept as it is, and the remaining portion will be will be kept equal to the threshold value. So that is what it is uh, it did, and that is how this looks so flat out here because it is only a single pixel value. As I said, it is just with the flat. I can just compare this with this one. This is having all the shapes, but this is having directly the you know the flat image. So this is what uh, most of thresholding is. Now, uh, one more thing. This is all about grayscale images I have been talking so far. So, anyone, if have anyone have doubts, then you can just inquire right now. Yeah, go ahead and ask me. Or is it clear up to this point? Is it clear up to this point? Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay. This concept is very, uh, like, you know, preliminary kind of concept. So, obviously, it is bound to be very clear. Now, I will just move on to this concept. Actually, the people who have actually attended the last session obviously have a brief idea about this. But actually, I'm going to go into a bit more detail on this one because it is important. Yeah. So, what we have here, this is a uh, HSV thresholding because this is how we do the thresholding of uh, images like this one, that is basically a three channel image. So, what we have is we just change the image into a HSV color space. Now, color space is basically just like RGB color space. We have HSV color space. But this time, the RGB color space is a uh, like a three-dimensional cubic representation of the color. In HSV, this is a cylindrical coordinate representation. If that is not clear, then you can just see this image. You can see here. Yeah. Whatever it is. So basically, it basically shows all the color in a form of a like a 
form of a like cylinder, right? So this is how the HSB color space is represented. Uh, so moving on, how what H, S, and V basically determines is basically hue, saturation, and value. Now H basically gives us the color value that is going to have basically lighter blue or darker blue. Basically, it is still a blue color, so basically that is given by the H. S gives the saturation of the image that is it is towards the that is you can see like uh, as it moves towards the outer section. The colors get more intense, like the intensity increases of the color of the from the blue for the blue color that is right here. You can have a low intensity color at saturation with the saturation level value very less, and you can have a high value at this particular at the end. So uh, in the cylindrical format, it is basically the radius basically represents the saturation, and the angle basically represents this is the angle. If you take this as a circle and we move on in the 360 degree across it, then it is basically the angle, and that angle basically gives us the h value. And the V value, basically, it is given by the height of that particular rectangle. If the height is very less, then it will be here. Yeah, it is bound to be a, a, a color which is having a very light, uh, less amount of brightness. And it, if it is having a uh, you know large value, then it is basically having a very bright color. Uh, so that is the basically HSB thresholding. Now, where we want to use this? I think HSB color space is uh, clear. I guess. Can anyone confirm this? Is this HSP color space clear? Okay, great. Okay, great. Great. Mm, okay. So moving on, uh, where to use this particular color space? Now, uh, when you are just, uh, you know, there are certain situations where you actually, and this is specifically from the deep learning point of view, because you need to create those ground truth images, right? So, uh, and it is not always the fact that uh, the, you know, the, the this is all, many times in real life scenarios, you will probably see that there is, uh, like even I'll just show you this how I did this. This is uh, this is uh, this is more you know this is quite nice. Actually, I can see that uh, this part. If I want to just segment this person out, then you can see that this person has is having a lot of colors within his like in, in the boundaries that is covering his, the entire person. Right. If you go to the entire like if you just consider this bar person or the man, you can see multiple color values are within this particular person. Right. So we cannot threshold those images to create the ground. Right? That is one of the huge problems I can face with like the traditional image processing techniques. That is why we are more concerned towards the deep learning part. Uh, just because of this, because because the, we don't have because it is like the, this is like uh, hard coded. So basically, you have the uh, like the values already fixed, and the basically model does it based on the color value it has and not on the structure and other criteria. So basically, it is not possible for a thresholding technique to segment. All those and form basically the mask that is here having like right. and you cannot form basically this a thresholding uh, thresholding uh, like a algorithm cannot make this a traditional uh, image processing uh, cannot make from this you cannot make this one so we need deep learning for that but before uh, going to the deep learning you need to learning model for sure so in that point what you do is basically you just Go to MS Paint and basically just cover this man with some certain color which is not present in that particular boundary, right? In this particular image, and you just just you know the color the entire person from this original color it is he uh, she was having into this particular yellow or a color which is basically not in the image, and then you can do the thresholding pretty easily because this is a flat color you can see here, and then you can just do O2 or even HSV thresholding for a matter of fact as I have done it here. Uh, you can use that. And for this, I have a code which basically does the thresholding for you. I'm gonna show you here where it is. I think this is the code. Yeah. Uh, so what it does is basically, I'm gonna run this. Okay. Now we have an implementation problem with you. Okay. So what it will basically first of all, it run the program. I think there's any issues. Okay, we're gonna run. I think the best call is because we have a sign. Yeah, we're gonna run this. Now they're all gonna show me. Okay, so where is the problem? Oh, 
Okay, I'll just look into it. Actually, I have a video for this that I have already been using it. Oh, what do I do? I think it could not work. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what this particular function does is basically just create this particular track bar kind of thing that is here. And you can just adjust these particular values to get the actually the range that is I'm talking about in this slide. That is this blue, if you can see this particular color within this blue region, as for humans it is quite clear it is blue. But for this uh, for this uh, for like in terms of math analysis, if you see this, this is not a single color, right? This is, there is a range of colors that is in. So you can just this portion is like dark blue and this portion is light blue. So obviously you can figure this thing out that I know the blue region basically exists within a certain range. So this is the lower bound that I have obtained after doing that particular code, which is not running currently, ignore that. Uh, and this is the upper bound within which this particular blue region exists. Now we want to create a uh, mask that is the ground truth for, you can say that as a ground truth for this. So basically we do that, uh, we, we need that ground truth and we want to create that thing. And ROI that we have represented is obviously the region of interest so that, that is why we went in right here. Now, uh, what you can do is, uh, I just show the image, like a video as of now. Yeah. Now, you can see this. I have just changed this value in this particular slider, and uh, you can see that, you know, this thing goes by. And basically, that is what it is detecting because if it is getting basically any bluish kind of color, then it will basically turn into a, to turn it into a mask and just do this thing. And, these are, value, these are the value of the H as B, that is the lower H, lower S, and lower V, and this is the upper range that is here, I think, here. So I'll just give the code after I just test it out after the session and just uh, upload it uh, in the GitHub repository and just share the link for that. Uh, so I'll just end this video right here. Okay. Yeah, so uh, there, that was it. Uh, that was for the threshold link that is do show HSB. HSB. Basically, what you do is any pixel value that is within this particular range will be turned into a white pixel. Any and any value which is not within that particular bound will be basically turned into a black. And for that, we need to convert this particular BGR or RGB image into a HSB, which is basically done by this particular statement right here, as we have done in the gray grayscale case. It is PG2 dot color. Then we just BGR to HSB. That is what it is. Uh, that is what it is. Okay, now moving on, uh, we'll just, uh, I think up to here it is clear. I hope it is clear. Can anyone confirm about this? Uh, any doubt regarding HSB as the code didn't went? So basically, you can ask a uh, doubt about it. I will solve the proof for you. Is it clear up to this point or should I explain it? So just someone can say that. Okay, great. Okay, great. So uh, I'll just uh, upload the code after going to the code one second because you know I have been running code from the same uh, kernel that I having seen that is actually problem arose. Okay, uh, uh, moving on. Now we this is the main important part of this entire session. This is the main. I I want all the attention that you can give for the for the sessions and those who are planning for the for the session. And this is basically a series of uh, like uh, the image process that I'm going to continue. So yeah. So what are filters? Basically, if you like want to just know what the filters are, basically the filters are necessarily just uh, 2D uh, arrays, right? That you basically apply over an uh, over an uh, image to get a certain kind of feature or certain extra certain kind of information from the image that you want. So I just show certain. Uh, I've just given some sources out here. Just I'm gonna type this thing and just do the math searching for you. I just show how this actually thing. Is what filters actually does. So you can see here the filters are basically a wide range of filters that we are having. Here. Okay, this is the identity filter, edge detection filter, their number. Of. So what we do is we apply this particular filter, and this is for for your information. This is only an image of. You can imagine this as an image, which is basically of size three cos three. So basically, what we are doing, we just uh, we just move this all over the image. Into this is suppose this is the input image. We move. This that process is called convolving, and we convolve this particular filter all over this particular image, and we finally get the desired edge in this case because this is the edge section filter. So we get this particular image that we are having. This, the outlines of that particular animal is quite visible in this case. So this is what filters basically does, and there are multiple kind of features, the blurring filters that you can question that we are going to cover in this one. 
and there vast number of filters are there simply uh, if you want to just imagine what filters are the filters are basically nothing but just 2d images like 2d or 2d arrays or in, that's for the matter and this size is 3 cos 3 it can even up, go up to like uh, 5 cos 5 or anything uh, you can apply like a very large dimension filters but you will get a different effect for that so these are the basically filters so, and according to wikipedia or like google the filter is a device or process that removes unwanted components or features from a signal and in this case signal is basically an image uh, but mm, to in a simple words if i want to say this is basically a 2d array and there are numbers which is basically convolved over an image to get certain desired result so these are some of the examples that we have here this is basically i think uh, this is basically uh, let me check this that yeah this is basically the edge section these are these are actually yeah this this all three are basically the edge section i just copied from here to here uh, yeah so uh, so what we do with this filter we basically convolve it around an image so this is basically the uh, first of all i'm just going to uh, explain you the what this convolution operation is so first of all convolve for to understand convolution operation let us see this particular video like it is this is a clip basically in short you can see that can get the idea about it is. so uh okay so this window moves particular input in which you can see here this is basically the convolution operation and it is doing certain map that i'm going to explain you right now but this is how that particular filter moves across the image as you can see here so this is what convolution operation basically means it does some it basically moves across the image it does some mathematics it creates a new filter or new image or filter it creates a new result resultant image so there is a uh, convolution operation basically does so so first of all what is the mathematics involved i'm going to say you that suppose we are having a filter of this this is a three cos three filter which are having a value of 1 0 -1 0 0 0 and 1 -1 0 1 so when we do, the, do a convolution basically we put this particular filter and we just place it over the first window or because the value we are having uh, so this is the value so you can think about this as a window and we are placing it over the input image right and you can just move you can just you can just imagine that moving uh, portion like this as this image that this window is moving and on, we are only applying those mathematical operations only to this particular uh, like elements that is presented in that particular region of the image on which that the uh, filter is now the for the mathematical part what we do is basically we do an element wise multiplication this is not a matrix multiplication don't confuse with that it is an element wise multiplication and we sum the entire thing up the final value as you can see here this particular zero that is the first element of this particular input image is multiplied with the first value of the filter uh, filter 2d array and then similarly we done do the all the operation that is second one to the second one third one to the third one the fourth fourth and performing like this you can see this operation particularly here as i was going to share this uh, slide you can you can just check it later on that i'm just multiplying these values with corresponding values or corresponding positions in that particular image and particular that particular window and we are summing that all up and we are getting this particular value six because in this case since most of the value of zero so see one into zero is three also gives us zero then second obviously zero the two is basically into multiplied with minus one basically gives us a minus two and this particular portion minus one into one will give the minus one as well so basically we have we if you add this two up then we get a minus three and at the end since this is zero obviously this is zero and since the last position is one and we multiply it with nine and we add this entire value basically we get six so i hope this mathematical operation is clear if anyone have doubt please ask me this like i will play it again and again no issue with that just tell me If anyone has doubt with this, just please ask me. Is it clear to here? Okay, great, 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 great. Okay, great. Uh, so this is basically the conversion operation. Now uh, there are certain. Uh, Uh, within the convolution of person, and this is this will be particularly important when we go to the deep learning part because when we are working with images in deep learning, we are most of the time using the script CNN that is uh, convolution neural network. So this is the basic operation that we get both on into that particular thing. So yeah, there are two more things that 
uh, that are important in convolutional question that is one is stride now stride is basically the measurement measure of the movement of the particular filter over the image both in the horizontal and the obviously the, the vertical direction now this is you can see here when we have a stride value of 1 basically we navigate show the image without skipping any of the columns like this first of all it takes the like it, this is the like a window it first take the image of this one like first do the mathematical operation over this uh, window and then it moves if the stride is 1 it will just move one step at a time and will go to the second position like here as you can see part here and if at the third time it will go to this position and in the uh, vertical position like vertical direction it will just move one step ahead and it will go like to this position right it will go to this particular position and then to this and step up but however if the stride was two then the movement will be more faster okay so first of all at the if the stride was suppose two then at the first position it will be like here and the second position it won't be here but it will be at here this will skip one uh, skip one column or one even row for the cylinder effect. And the next move position it will move not to this position, but to this position it will move because the stride is two. Because it is skipping one value at a time and one column or one row at a time and then moving to the next position. That is why the stride is two. And I hope this stride concept is clear. Can anyone give me a yes? Is that clear? Okay, great. Okay, moving on. What we have is uh, now next the next thing that we have is for that actually we need to again go to the video that we had earlier. Now I clearly see this is the input image and this is the basically the filter they are applying in this particular image. And you can see that the output image they are having actually a size reduction. That is initially the image was six cross six image and now the image is basically only this portion. This zero, this value doesn't matter at all. This is zero is basically having no information, this value doesn't matter at all. Uh, so what happens is, yeah, you can see the resultant image is basically only four by four matrix. So there is actually a formula for that to how to measure that particular reduction, but I'm not going to that part. But yeah, we will go that, uh, go into that for when we do the CRM part. So uh, yeah, you can see here that uh, the, the size, there is a size reduction, right? That is from six plus six, it just changes to four plus four to tackle that part. But when we do image processing, we don't want our image to go uh, to you know, undertake any loss. Like it, it basically when you're losing columns and rows, you are using, uh, losing, losing information, right? So we don't want that. So uh, what we do, there is a concept called padding. Now, suppose if we have a six cross six, or in this case, we have a five cross five image. And if we can somehow increase the size of this image into let's say seven cross seven, then upon yeah, no, applying the convolution, we are still getting an image that is of size 5 cross 5. That is, we had initially a 5 cross 5 uh, image. Now we want, uh, we just increase this, uh, like somehow a certain way, we just increase this size to uh, 7 cross 7 so that we don't undergo any law. And now we apply convolution over it, then we can get that, that the output as a 5 cross 5 image. So that we don't do get any loss from the input and the output. So that is the basic motivation behind it. So, but uh, how it does, how it does it. So, you can see here, uh, this is the input image that we had that we apply the filter and we get a 3 cross 3 image. That is, it was input image of 5 cross 5, applied the convolution, we get a uh, 3 cross 3 image. Now, to tackle this, we do padding. Now, what is padding? Padding, adding an extra row and column of zero, basically. Now, basically, this is this was the original image that we had here. And now we are applying this particular zeros up here. Basically, an additional column. Basically, here we have two columns and obviously two rows up here as well. Rows and columns. So this is what padding is. Now, it's like and how it will reduce. I'm just explaining. Suppose this is the filter that we are applying and how it maintains the size. We had initially a five plus five image and this is a five plus five output image. Okay. So uh, when we move this filter, we just place it first at this position. So basically. After adding that all up, we get the value at this, right? That is obviously you just uh, you know adding this all up, we just get this like uh, the result and we store in this particular thing. Now, as we move on with a side of one, then we just go to this one, uh, this one, and we just get a value at this position. And if I move throughout the image with a side of one, 
then the output, resultant output that we will be having will be having a side of high stock side. Now, this concepts are very important. So, if you have any doubt regarding this, this uh, let's see if you got. Okay, what are the effects of strides? So, uh, when we skip the strides, obviously, you will have a reduction in the size of the input. Okay, in strides, it, it will move something else. Oh, it will start, the stride will first of all move one by one. Let this from the uh, first of all, imagine from uh, okay, the shoulder. The stride will move first of all in this position, then it will just go to this, like this, and then again, like this, and then, like you know, horizontal, and then the transition motion right here. And for uh, Sweta that she asked, obviously, if the stride value, obviously, if we just increase the slight stride value, then obviously, we will have a reduction in the image size as well. So in most of the, the deep learning applications, when we apply convolution layer, we if you want to if you want to you know if you want to keep the uh, like keep the dimension same, what we do is we keep the stride as one and we keep the padding padding so that it can it doesn't get reduced. So changing any of it will basically if you don't give padding and if you just increase the stride, it will obviously reduce the size of the input image in the output. So is that clear or do you have any doubts regarding that as well? I'll just explain it. Is that clear? Okay, great. Uh, so after this, one. okay, okay, great, great, great. Okay. Now moving on, what we have is now we are gonna go into the uh, filters. Now there are uh, various kind of filters you can get, like from uh, like, you know noise removal filters to a range of you know, like uh, edge detection, whatever. There are many. So we we're gonna do noise removal filters. There are three filters we're gonna show in this session. And one is edge detection filter. Uh, now, uh, what is noise basically? Suppose this is an image, and you can see there, and this is this particular type of noise is called salt and pepper noise because, as you can see here, probably. So what you can see here is basically you are having this small dot dot kind of thing. So you are having white dots and the black dots and the grayish dots, whatever it is. It is not basically it is not smooth. Now, uh, you like you know removal of this uh, this particular kind of noise basically uses blurring technique. Now, this can be pretty weird. Actually, I found it weird. So I'm saying right now, blur, how you'll be like, how does, uh, you know, blurring the things actually reduce the noise? But actually it does. Basically, what it does is it basically decreases the sharpness of that particular noise. So when you do the blurry, blurry thing, blurred thing, then what it does is basically it reduces those sharp ends and this uh, uh, tone, them down, tone them down. Now, what we want from a, uh, you know, filter that does the blurring. We want only to reduce those particular pixels which have some, like, you know, weird kind of uh, sudden kind of uh, changes, that is, sudden spike, as we can see right here, right, in this position that we have. But, however, we also want to keep the structural information same. Like, we want this edge of this hat in this particular picture to be the hat, uh, to be the, you know, the, to be the hat, like, right. We want that mark to be there. So we don't want those things to be hurt, but what we want is we want this particular noise to be reduced and not uh, definitely the edges or the image. So what we do is uh, we have multiple ways of doing it. First of all, this is called averaging or blur filter in short. So what it does is it really averages between the uh, averages in the particular window it is having. Suppose uh, if this is the thing. Okay, okay, just take this thing. Okay, what is not visible? Okay, ignore. Suppose uh, we are having this particular window. Yeah, and what this filter does is basically it goes throughout this image and it will, what it will do, it will do is basically it will add all the pixels up and take an average of it. Now, this where is where from where this nine value came from. This is because this is basically nothing but the summation of each and every element of that particular filter. Basically, we are just scaling this filter down, right? Now, why we do this? First of all, after adding the filter, we don't want to add any extra information to the image, right? That is the basic principle of it. We don't want to add any extra information to the input image. So basically, we just uh, scale this thing down, and that is why we are having this uh, one by nine out here, right? So this is basically the thing. Uh, so this is the this is the blur filter that we're having. This is just averages down and just. Uh, and it's uh, obviously this is basically consulting around all this in, all in this input image. Actually, you just need to see the, this particular kernel. This is also called kernel. The filters are also known as kernel. So just forget to say that. Yes, just remember that. Filters are also known as kernel. So what 
So uh, you just need to see what this kernel basically does. So this is just can be obviously of size five cos five or three cos three, and you can see a clear difference in it. Because when you use the kernel size as three, we get a certain amount of uh, blurriness in here, as you can see from this to image. If I just enlarge them, I think I hope you just you are going to able to able to see that there's a certain amount of blurriness in this. Now suppose we just keep the same. If we increase the kernel size, what it will do? Now it is basically ever for a larger type of image than the earlier it was doing when it was three cos three. Hence the averaging will be basically done to a, and you will get a more more smoother kind of like more blurrier kind of image as we are having right here. So this is basically a five cos five uh, uh, filter that we are applying here, and this is basically a three cos three filter that we are applying here. So this is the difference that you get when you do a three cos three filter and five cos five filter. Uh, specifically, when you are going for like uh, uh, you know denoising filters or basically smoothening filters that you are having out uh, there. So these are the things that you need to note. As uh, basically the kernel size increases, the blurriness will increase and it will be more prominent when you see out there. So this is one thing. Next, what we have is Gaussian filter. Now, Gaussian filter, you can uh, like if you see this particular uh, Gaussian filter kernel, you can clearly see the middle portion. It is basically obviously a square matrix, and it is the middle middle element that it is having. It is having the maximum value, and it just reduces to the uh, the corner side. Right? So basically, you can see, you can for sure you obviously all know about the Gaussian distribution, right? It is just a dumbbell shape. Oh, that is not dumbbell shape. This is bell shape curve. So this is what they try to do at but it in a like a 3D fashion that is the middle portion is the highest and then it goes reduce and this 16 that we are scaling it with it uh, scaling it and that is basically the summation of all the values out here it just add this thing up and we just scale every value with one by 16 out here because if you add this thing up one two one that is four then this is eight and this is again four four plus four we get eight and eight plus eight we get 16 that is what we are scaling it with uh, so this is it. So now there is one another parameter that is called sigma, that is the standard deviation of that particular, uh, like that is particular distribution, right? So if we increase the sigma, then we will be having a more blurrier image, and if the sigma is close to zero, then we will be having a more kind of you know more similar, more uh, we are having an image which is more similar to the input image, and when the sigma value actually increases, we get more blurry kind of. Thing. I can understand if you don't get see the difference right here. It is almost the same because it is not that much you know, uh, interpretable. But this is what we use. Gaussian filter. So I'll just uh, quickly show you the applications out here. Uh, so what we have here is this very okay. Uh, so we took the same image that we took for that, and just we just again go and uh, just run this, and then we have we just read this particular image that is the input image that we are having, and we will just first add the blur. Uh, like the blur filter that we applied for, so we're going to do this and just show you the blur image. Yeah, there you go. It is not expandable. I'm sorry for that, but yeah, it is actually blurred a bit. Actually, you can this is this image is the really same as you can see right here. This is what we are doing that in that that portion. This is the input image and the blur image that is. This is the real output that I have created uh, previously. So this is it. Uh, so this is the blur image. So for the Gaussian filter, I'm going to show you one thing. Uh, this is the question. So we're going to run this part. We are adding the same three cost the image, and we are doing the Gaussian operation right here. And this one that I am presenting here, this basically represents the sigma value that you are putting. And there is actually one more argument that is uh, that is this sigma x and the sigma y. This sigma first, is the first value is basically the standard deviation across the x direction. And the other one, this will signify sigma across the y direction. So basically, and suppose if you only give one value, then it will put the same value for the sigma y part. Uh, so this is it. So sigma, this is a function that is easy to give to Gaussian blur. Then we have blur, and it takes similarly the image and obviously the kernel size that we are having here. We can pop this up, and the kernel size that we are having here, and this is obviously the sigma value. Yeah. So we have just run this, and we're going to see this uh, particular output that we are having here. This is it. So this is uh, okay. I'll just show you the slide for sure. This thing, if I copy this here and just set it right here, you can see there is kind of almost a similar kind of thing. But obviously in Gaussian, what happens? The edges are much more enhanced, or the is still retained in the image. So I think that is why we are having this. 
Uh, so it is not that much visible. Yeah, yeah. Question definitely, definitely just you know uh, give you more information about the edges of the image. So you can imagine. Okay, this is the question. Now, one interesting thing that you can do with this particular filter. Now, this is not that interesting, but obviously, what you can do is uh, Gaussian value, as I have already stated, that you can have different sigma values during the same kernel zone. So, for different sigma values, it will give you different amounts of blurriness. First of all, uh, just give me a yes if you have understood the Gaussian part. Is that clear to Gaussian and the blur, the filter that we have applied? Okay, I got one yes. Okay, okay, great, great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so what we can do is, uh, so this is the thing. Now, in difference of Gaussian, this is a particular concept that is called difference of Gaussian or dog in short. Uh, I love dogs. Uh, so we have different sigma values out here. It is zero, and then we have one out here. Now, what we do is, do is we just do a bitwise subtraction, right? We just simply subtract the numbers. And we get this thing, this weird thing like this, which is which looks like a keyword code, but that is not. But uh, in this case, you can see some lines out here, but obviously it makes no sense. But uh, however, this particular question can be very useful. I'll just show you one thing that I have been doing. Where it is? This should be filed up here. So then, put it in. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is basically an image of a bullet. I cannot go into the details because of the certain restrictions regarding this. This is one of my research work. Uh, so what we do here is basically so if you can lines out here, right? But the issue with this is that you cannot threshold and just extract these lines because you know you can see there's a lot of difference in the pixel values going on within the same range. This basically range is what this is basically golden to something of brownish color of range, which is within the same range of information. So you cannot apply simple techniques to do that. But however, during the initial days of the we applied some image person techniques to do that. And one of them was to extract these lines you can see right here. Uh, uh, this line basically, we can just we just want to extract this line. So we applied the dog that is different of Gaussian. We just found out the we just find out different uh, Gaussian value images of this. So we just blurred this image with various values of sigma and we just negated them. And you can see certain interesting things going on here. You can see this is one, and basically, you just and uh, suppose the sigma value I'm saying that range that can be from like suppose you from this particular image, we have actually taken uh, like we have taken at least or uh, more than. 10 images which are having different value of sigma. Suppose we have one is zero, then one is 0 0.1, then is one is 0 0.2, and so on to up to one or even more than that. And then these all pictures you now images have different level of blurriness. And we just subtract them one by one, element wise. Now what it does is basically it just shows, it just extracts certain information from this. That is, you can clearly see that there, now this is more clear that since it is black and white. Uh, so it, you can see there is this uh, particular lines are more uh, important, like you can get uh, those. And further, if you just move on, at different level of sigma, you can see different types of, you know, information being extracted out here. You can see here. And these particular questions are very important when you are working with machine learning models. I repeat, this is basically very important for machine learning uh, processes. This is called feature extraction or feature engineering in short, uh, for the, as a whole the domain. So you can see for various uh, difference of Gaussian values, we just get different type of images. So this is one application of the type of question. That is why I kept that DOG, then it didn't have that you know, entire function for that. But yeah, that is one thing you can do with it. Because that is what I had did probably here. Just, yeah, that is hopefully because we can just see this one perfect here. So this is what it is, DOG, here it is. Now, last filter that we had for the denoising part is the major filter. Now, how major filter works? Now, medium filter don't necessarily have a kernel. What it does is it just, uh, I'll just go ahead and just check the Wikipedia link out here. Uh, if you type in here, here, okay, median filter, Wikipedia. Yeah, you can see here. Suppose uh, 
uh, this is how it is applied. So, uh, you obviously, you will have a certain kernel value that is free cost free or whatever it is. In this case, we have applied it to a one dimensional kind of data that is, it can be a single line or whatever it is. So, how it is, I'll just show you how it works. Really. You have this particular, uh, like, you know, kernel size of three. So, if you just, this is the input image that we are having. So, you just go over this image, which has pride of one, and do the uh, operation for you. So first of all, it will go, since the kernel value is three, it will first go to the first three value and just find the median value from this three number. Obviously, we have three out here, so basically it will replace that particular image or the, this is the output result of an image and this is the output, final output that we're getting. And obviously, in this case as well, we are getting a reduction in the size. For that, again, you have to add padding for to reduce that. So, yeah. So what you do is basically, uh, we just take three uh, values as far as the window or the kernel is concerned. And we just get the tree that is this is the median of this this three values and this is basically the tree. And then next we move on to the second part of this side of one. So basically we move one step to the right and we take this tree value and we find the median. Now for median it is very important that first you arrange all the elements in the ascending order. So basically they arrange it into three, six, and eighty as you can see probably here. Three, six, eighty, then eight to the middle there because that is what median it is. So it's just six value is placed on the input on the output image that you finally get. And that is how it just they they went from this position then to this, then to this, and then at the last this and this again you do the ascending uh, like you know the arranging order. Then you get uh, three as probably the yeah three as the output from this particular thing. So this is how median filter actually works and median filter is very actually one of those filters we actually uh, who does actually maintain the uh, you know the this it just uh, keeps the uh, edge information for the yeah those edge information as it is and it just don't harm those so you can clearly see and as I have Hello, am I audible now? Yes, you're audible. Okay, great. Actually, just the net got this Okay, uh, I'll just again move on to this. Uh, uh, can you somehow say up to which I explained actually? Did I explain the median, uh, you know, functioning of the median, median filter? Or should I repeat it again? Just give me yes or no. Take me to one second, actually. Hello. Oh, one minute to uh -huh. one second. Just thirty second, man. Okay. Thirty second, man. Okay, great. Okay, just I'll just uh, so make. How it does? Okay, so that is how it does the median filter, and uh, obviously, if you have a kernel size that is greater, then obviously you will be getting a more blurrier image because again. Same thing. It is it is going across a larger, a larger window. So this is major feature. So I'll just uh, go ahead and run this uh, particular thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For CV2, it is simple. Uh, again, CV2 that median blur. You have the image for directly you have here, and this is the image. This takes the source image as the input, and this tree basically represents the size of the kernel that you are uh, that you are using. It and in case of images, it will be three cos three. You just take one single value. Yeah. So uh, I just go ahead and run this and just see the output. Yeah, you can see here. Now, if I just, again, if you just change this particular value to probably how much? Seven, you will get a more blurrier image. Yeah, I hope you guys see this. This is more blurrier than the other previous one. This is what it is major filter. Now, uh, I'll just, uh, the, the last thing I wanna do is basically the edge detection filters. And again, there are way more numbers of filters, uh, you know, the injection filters are there. But uh, I, right now I'm using a, a, a any edge detection. And this is uh, not necessarily a filter, but this is actually a anti-algorithm, right, do the edge detection. And it actually uses Gaussian filter as a part of it. I'll just uh, suggest you to go to this particular link and just read the documentation part of it. Actually, documentation, it is not exactly documentation, but this is the theoretical end of it. Actually, it is very important that you have your theories clear actually to actually use them in certain projects because you actually should know that for what it is intended to you, right? So that is what it is. It, it, uh, it, is, it is again using some uh, techniques that we have already used. 
that is it actually does use Gaussian filter as I've already mentioned. And again, it uses thresholding technique for this particular thing to make you notes know, to separate. Now it takes uh, two values, a three uh, like a three uh, like a three uh, arguments. First is the image itself, obviously, that is CG2 or can is the function to do it in CG2. And the lower and the upper basically it shows the gives the threshold on based on which the threshold link to the image will be done. So I will suggest you to if you go to this particular documentation and read those stuff and it will be more clear to you. Yeah, I have this attached those. And uh, if I find the research paper really based on this, then I will obviously attach that to the documentation that I will be provided. I'll just attach it to the code. Right. So uh, Basically, you can see here, this is the input image that I fed to it, and it just gets uh, because of this particular image that is the output or uh, an output of this particular filter, or uh, say the algorithm, and this has a lot of edges in it, as you can clearly see, and this particular thing is clearly visible. Even you can see those grooves right here in the, and this is basically an image of a neuron, human neuron, probably a model or whatever it is. You can clearly see even those are grooves right here as well. So those stuff, and actually uh, the Kenny edge detection actually uh, you know rejects uh, those slight uh, noisy lines that you get, which are actually of no use. And actually, you can hence use Kenny at a multiple level. Now, how to use this? Again, it's very simple when it comes to OpenCV. Uh, I just uh, go ahead. And... Uh, this is uh, first of all, I'll just read the image as I always do. Then okay, now okay, let's go to the middle of it. Which is visible. Yeah. First of all, uh, I'm going to show this image. Hopefully, uh, okay. So, hold on. I'm just apply this algorithm. Okay. Now, uh, we are uh, we having input image of IMG as we have mentioned here, and uh, we are going to apply the Kenny filter to it. So, basically, we just uh, gave this uh, image to this particular uh, function that is EG2 that Kenny T uh, is capital obviously, and these are the two basically threshold values that we are having hundred. So basically, these are the threshold values of beta, which the threshold limit is done. Now, uh, still here, we are, have run this program. Kenny has just run that. And now I'll just show you the output that we are having for the Kenny, right? Yeah. Okay. Now you can clearly see this is the, uh, the input image that we are having, and this is the output image that we finally came up with. So this basically detects all the edges. And, and this actually particular method is very useful when it comes to you know the microscopic images that you can applications of the of you know the uh, deep learning models and everything. So yeah, I just stop my presenting here because this is probably the end of the thing. But yeah, that is where you can use those things. Okay. Uh, so uh, image first thing is very important when you are doing those stuff and specifically uh, when you want to do certain applications. I will just tell you that. As I have already mentioned, because to create the data set in deep learning and those stuff, you actually need image processing so that you can get all the information out there and you can extract those. So that is very important. And one more, if, uh, like in most of the cases, uh, in the, specifically when in the research line, you don't have that much of uh, like uh, data in with you. So you need to create data. So in the, those cases, uh, you need to apply those. Uh, specifically when you are doing some biomedical imaging or those stuff, these filters are very important. And then again, when you are trying to increase the quality of the image, again, these are very important. So I'll suggest you to do those, uh, do those, and I'll just uh, give all the links and the various YouTube channels that are doing great job in image processing and stuff. And at the next time, I will think I think I will just go into deep learning models and stuff. So if uh, anyone of you are interested in what uh, like what you would like to have in the next sessions and everything, so just uh, just hit me up. So I hope you like this session and uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending this.